to the IBJJF podcast. My guest today is Manuel Hibamar. Hibamar is a 2019 Nogi World Champion and a 2020 European Champion, and he's going to be competing at the upcoming Nogi Pans here in October. Manuel, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for having me on the IBJJF podcast. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, you know. It's an honor to have you here. I'm really excited for the conversation. So I wanted to start with your 2022 and kind of do a little review of it. You competed at the Pans, you competed at the Worlds, and you competed at the Austin Open, Gi and Nogi. How would you rate your performance so far in 2022 in your competitions? Uh, 2022 was the was the year actually that I, I came back after being a, a dad, right? Uh, I took like a long break. And uh, so I was focused on Worlds, so I decided to lose a like, bunch of weight. I lost like about like 44 pounds just so I could make weight for Worlds, right? I started on pants, right? I started on pants. Uh, that's how I started to cut the weight. And I believe that in the Pan American, I was my weight was already like near of the you know the way that I wanted that I, that I aimed, and I could like have a good performance on the Pan Ams, so where I did like three fights. And I beat a lot of tough guys, and I had the opportunity, you know, to close out the division with my teammates, which was Leandro and Sebastian, and which I end up like allowing Sebastian to be the champion of the bracket because he will be the, he would be considered the first Costa Rican of the world, you know, and in ever to win a Pan American Championship. So you know, like. Uh, it, you know, like I rather see my, my friends, you know, success than, you know, it's, it's one more title. I think that I'll have, I st I'm still very young. I'm going to have like more opportunities to make, to pay names, you know, and we still win, uh, on worlds. I lost, like I said, I was like four years without making this weight. And so I lost a lot of, uh. Out of, of the pace of the weight, no, because every single weight class there's a different pace, and I had, I I understood that in the hardest way, right? Because I end up like getting, losing to Andy, which is Andy's an amazing athlete as well. He's he's been coming from a very good, uh, you know, a very good experience, you know, like competing everything on lightweight division. He was in a better shape than me for sure, and I felt a lot of the rhythm actually. And that's why I well I end up like losing by almost like ten, four points plus he submitted me in the final, which is you know every loss I take as a learning experience right, and now I'm like kind of going back to medium heavy, which is I believe that one of the best way that I've been competing right now. I think more like one of the most important titles was on this division, so I believe that I can do pretty good on this one. And on the Austin Open, I was already like since you know since pans, I, w I was already on the rhythm, and I did one fight. I fought like a really tough uh, kid from I think he was from Ryan Gracie or Hans Gracie. I don't know. I don't remember really well. Uh, and then I ended up like winning by I don't know like twelve points, seventeen points, and I submitted. Uh, which was like really good performance. I was very happy with my performance, especially after. Uh, uh, taking a loss, you know, like it's always good to come back and win some, right? And then on the final, actually, I, I closed out with my teammate. He actually trains with, with me here. Uh, we brought him from Brazil to actually to train with us, Carlos Net. And yeah, and then after that, like it, I took this break until now, but uh, focus actually on on the Pan American, right? Uh, I feel good, you know, I feel good. I feel that, that I'm ready, actually. You mentioned that you had to lose quite a bit of weight to compete at middleweight coming into the Pan Ams and the other tournaments. What was that process like, dropping all that weight and then competing after going through such a hard weight cut? Man, it was a, it was a decision, you know. Like, uh, you know, a, a life of an athlete, there's a lot of up and downs, right? Sometimes you want to do it so bad. Sometimes you just feel like you don't want to do it because you, you're, you're lacking in confidence, right? Lack, lacking in discipline. Plus, being a dad affects you a lot because I don't, I'm don't. i not only a dad, but also I'm a, a, 
I have my own business, right? I have my own Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu school, which I have to run everything, right? By myself, me and my wife. So it's it's hard, you know? And like being a dad, like a new dad, right? Which is my, my first born. Uh, being a dad and being like a business owner, it's it's complicated. It's, it plus still have to find time to train, you know, like and follow your dreams. You know, it's it's not for everybody. It's you have to have a really good mind to do it. Yes. Let's talk a little bit more about that. You you mentioned a couple of times you just became a dad and you're a business owner, so you have a lot of responsibilities, a lot to manage off the mat. And like you said, that's going to change your training routine and your schedule and your diet and all those things. How has that process been? becoming a new dad, becoming a business owner and trying to manage that with your competition career. It's well, it's well, what am I going to say everybody probably know, it's not easy, right? But it's also not impossible. It's like very possible to be a business owner, dad and still compete, you know. I've been doing it. So and I I I believe that I've been having like good results, right? I always have good results, but like, you know, with the actual responsibility, it only makes me stronger minded guy, you know, like I, I believe that it's also a training for me, you know, like I don't feel that I'm training less than everybody. I feel that I'm training just about the same and there's no excuse for me. I just have to go out there, showcase my jiu-jitsu, do my best, you know, stay faithful, you know, in God and, you know, and know that he, he got my, he gets my back, right? And just continue to to push forward, you know, looking forward to the next goals. You have gotten great results, and we talked about how you're going to be competing at Nogi Pans coming up in October, and you're a Nogi World Champion. You've had a lot of success in Nogi. Do you want to talk about what some of the keys for your Nogi game have been to be able to translate all your gi skill into your Nogi competition? Uh, the way that I play on top with the gi, it's kind of like very similar the way that I play on top with Nogi. So I only had to kind of adjust my grip, you know, like more like a, a weightlifting grip, like raw grips, like holding the hands, the ankles, you know, like using the pommels and using like, you know, like my my forearms as a tentacle just to make sure that I create more suction and, and pressure. And I think that I, I I can do this transition really well, you know, because the, the way that I play on top with the gi is very similar. It's that everybody... I started to train uh, a lot of nogi lately, right? Uh, the whole jiu-jitsu scenario is kind of shifting, and I started to to train a nogi as well with like with my teammates and started explore a little bit more of leg attacks and leg defenses. Mm -hmm. I I'm I am a I'm a sort of guy that I studied jiu-jitsu a lot, you know. Like I I'm I'm always home and when I when I have time I watch videos, you know. I, how to defend, how to attack. I buy videos. I sign up subscriptions of, you know, all sort of like gyms. You know, I'm a very open-minded guy. So I believe that the moment that I stop to, you know, to want to to know more, that's the moment that I stop to evolve. So I just continue to grow by watching and applying training. That's it. So you're going to be competing at the Nogi Pans in the medium heavy division. It's a very stacked division. You have yourself, you have Jefferson Goresi, Gabriel Argis, Oliver Taza, Sebastian Rodriguez. Medium heavy is always really tough. But what are your thoughts on that division and what are your expectations? Well, for at this level, like you said, everybody's very tough. But I believe that whoever wins is the one who wants more, who the one who's more prepared, you know, like not only uh, mm -hmm. physically prepared, but also mental, mental prepared, you know. I believe that like every match will be a final. You know, I uh, just have to be smart and strategic. Uh, this is the way that I like to fight and find my way to one fight at a time to make to the final, you know, and see what happens. The competition is going to be in Texas, and that's that's where your home base is now. You're at Rodrigo Pinheiro in Texas. You have your academy. What has it been like moving to Texas, setting up your life there, and what's the jiu-jitsu scene like in Texas? So jiu-jitsu in Texas is very strong. You can tell now that a lot of people has been moving to Texas. Austin, especially, we have Golden Ryan now. They just moved, especially for Nogi. Uh, we have, like, really good people in Nogi here. Uh, like, gi, jiu-jitsu, I still that we are one of the best genes in Texas. Uh, you know, like, I don't think there's a lot of genes that does jiu-jitsu the way we do here in Texas. Uh, even though we have a lot of Gracie Baja, but mo most of the people from Gracie Baja, they're not here, like, 
the people that win is not actually from tech the the people that trains in Texas, you know. But I think that he in Texas we have Thiago Macedo, he he Nogueira, which are one of the best featherweights in the world right now, I believe. And I train here. There's Diego Schneider actually that he's been training with us. He's a uh, whoever don't know, don't know, he passed Bushesha's guard like two times in 2018. I don't know if you guys remember. He's a really good guy. He always makes to the podium of the Ultra Half Division of Worlds. So he's really tough training. We have Luan Zevedo as well, which is uh, he was the one who lost 2021 to Kainan in the final on the heavyweight. Uh, so we have a really good training out here. So we have really good people. And strong jiu-jitsu, you know. I think that uh, Rodrigo, it's an amazing coach. You know, he's he's like a general. So it's been a while. Like I believe that when see, even when I was at Cicero Costa back in the day, I didn't really have a coach. Now I feel that I actually have a master to take care of my performance. You know, to let me know when I'm lazy, to let me know, you know, when I should push myself more. You know. He helps me so much uh, in my growth, you know. He helped me since that I that I arrived here. Because to be real with you, the only ter- I trained with so many good people along my journey, and but these people, I never I could never win like a, a like a big tournament. <laughs> it was crazy, right? I trained with like a bunch of world champions, and I never won a single tournament. And then suddenly, whenever I joined Rodrigo, when I came from from São Paulo, and then I joined Rodrigo. He he just helped me a lot, you know. He made me understand jiu-jitsu in a simple way. I learned how to train myself without cheating on myself, you know. And uh, he helped me in so much of things that I had no idea that I didn't know, you know. Even though I trained in the gym, there was a bunch of killers, like people who does bidding bulls, axe guard, all type of games. And then he came here like, you need that, boom, basic. You need to learn how to control from the side, how to control from the back, how to control from the mouth. And then he was starting to train my basics, and I, I, I was able to mix very well the basic with the advanced. So I think that he was fundamental for my career, my BJJ career, you know. You mentioned a bit about training more nogi and getting more into the nogi stuff, the leg locks. Can we expect to see you at nogi worlds as well after nogi pen? Yeah, so my goal this year... Uh, I have Nogi Worlds and Pins. That's the one that I'm looking forward. And I'm going to try to do some Gi events as well just to maintain myself in shape, right? And because I felt that I should have I should have to compete more before Worlds. So I, it, I, like I was like a long, long time without competing in the weight class that I was going to fight. And then I ended up like messing it up like on the biggest tournament of the world, you know? And I still believe that I have good chances to make to to the finals. I still I still believe that I have uh, good chances to win worlds, right? Uh, so I probably have I'm like 28 right now, so my my birthday is coming soon. So I'm gonna be turning on 29 next year probably. I'm already able to find masters, but I believe that I have two more years, like two more strong years of my career on the adult worlds, and and after that I'm just gonna take care of the business, take care of my family, you know, and, you know, share jiu-jitsu with the community here in San Antonio and try to grow the jiu-jitsu community here and, you know, like try to give back to our community what they, what they don't have yet, you know. Yeah, that's a great, great goals to have for after your competition career. And we're seeing jiu-jitsu gr- grow so much nowadays. We just had jiu-jitsu con, which had gi events, no gi events, kids events it was such a massive turnout and just a massive event overall what are your thoughts on the growth of jiu-jitsu and how you've seen it take off over the past couple i believe of years? that we yeah, had the growth of jiu-jitsu it's 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 been like amazing you know like i think that jiu-jitsu right now is the most growing sport in the world like you know thanks to joe rogan experience that he talks a lot about jiu-jitsu on his podcast and he has like millions of followers Thanks also to IBGF that has been doing a great work now, especially now doing like more events for kids, you know. I think that the future of jiu-jitsu is the kids, man. It's just like the future of our genes is the kids, you know. Like those are the foundations of our sport. And this is like what the, I believe the most event to, events should focus on a lot, you know. And of course, 
adult is important for our sport and all, but you know, like, like the kids are the what what's the most important in the moment. Like, not only that, sometimes when we when we try to help others, other people from you know, like bringing them to United States and try to help them, an adult come with full of habits already, you know, so it's hard to deal with. But when you when you get a kid, since of the beginning, you teach them discipline. And you know, teach them that they need to be they that they must be committed to the to their goals. And this way, like we can build like a stronger foundation. You know, I want to go back a little bit and talk about the kids more because you said you really see the kids as the future of jujitsu, and I couldn't agree more. And we're seeing kids nowadays who start training when they're four to six years old, and by the time they're twelve, thirteen, they're already at a really high technical level. Can you talk about the growth and the technique that we've seen from kids as well? Yes, and now I I we can see a lot of parents like helping their kids, you know, like actually investing on their kids, which is amazing, right? And uh, well, talking about Cole, for example, Cole is there was the 17 years old that made 280cc right this weekend. Cole started training at Rodrigo's when he was three years old, three or four years old, right? So he left our school when he was 15, 15 or 14. So he's been training the Mendes brothers. He's 17, so he's been two, three years that he's been with the Mendes brothers. Uh, and Cole always had this this discipline, right? Uh, he always had this commitment, this discipline, and you can you can see that now he serves as an inspiration for a lot of kids, right? And actually, yesterday on the kids class on my school, I put in like a little a small clip. Of, uh, of Cole when he was like about 11 and I wanted to show to them right like look guys uh, that's how you guys should see yourself you know like if you have a goal in jiu-jitsu that's how you're supposed to you know uh, act in class you know like being consistent have commitment you know with your training Cole knew what he wanted since of the beginning that's why he's been collecting all the rewards that he has today so you know and then all the kids, man, the kids, all the kids was inspired, inspired to train, you know. And, like, the class became, like, a war room. All the kids were going really hard doing their best just because they watched, like, a small clip, you know. It's, like, so powerful and had a lot of impact on their, on their life. And, man, the kids are, they understand, you know. Like, if they get a good coaching a good mentorship, they will understand, they will make it that they will become professional, just like the adults. These kids, actually, they're more more professional than adults itself, you know? Well, Manuel, I really appreciate the time. It was a really fun interview. Did you have any final thoughts you wanted to share before we wrapped up the interview? Uh, I just want to tell everyone, you know, like that, uh, whatever you... So I'm only 28, right, but... Me and my wife were able to accomplish so much in our life, like at, such as like having our own house, you know, our, our own business. It's, you know, titles will come and go, right? This is a fact. So my wife won five times world. I won worlds as a brown belt. I won worlds as a noogie. But what I really want them to understand is that it's not, it's not, it's what you do with your title, right? So use that take advantage and build a better life to you because you don't want to have like 35 36 years old and not having accomplished so much in your life you know like or still being living at the gym or something like that uh i would say for everybody like wherever you you take if you have to take a decision take now early on your young age so the way that you can live a good life whenever you meet or you're like around your 30s or you're 40 years old you know Well, thanks. That's great advice. I really appreciate your time again. And thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll see you guys soon for another episode. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have a good good day.